Hi, welcome to Street Priest Ministries. I'm your host, Brother Jay. It's for taking the gospel back to the streets. Today's drive through message is Mount of Transfiguration, Ministering Spirits. All right, today we're going to cover the end of Christ's ministry, <coughs> or near the end of his ministry. And the significance of him, most people understand, misunderstand the significance of Christ being born in human flesh. He was born in human flesh to pay the price for sin of sinners that are born in human flesh. He had to become in the likeness like us. He had to come in the fashion of man. Now he couldn't be born of an earthly man excuse me, the earthly woman because you go in full circle, be set in flesh. Every person born of a man and woman had been a sinner since the fall of Adam and Eve. And he's the only one that came born of the Holy Spirit conceived by a virgin. And that was necessary. For him to be God man, to be able to have that within the law, you had to law of the redeemer, you had to be kin <clears throat> to the person that you were redeeming. Called a kin kinsman redeemer under the law. Christ fulfilled the law. The part of the law was to read the part about the kinsman redeemer. Uh, the book of Ruth emphasizes that, Not to which I've taught on, taught on the book of Ruth. So Christ had to be kin with us, being made in the likeness of flesh. He was God and man, and God man. He was God, man, and God man, a new creation. And he's called in the scripture the second Adam. First Adam failed. God sent his son in the likeness of flesh to die for our sins. He was all those Levitical laws that you read about in the Old Testament, the types of shadows of what Christ was to do at Calvary. He was to be the sacrificial lamb for us with the Passover stands for. And he fulfilled that role. But in route, being in a man, <clears throat> see a lot of people try to take the manly part out of Christ. They just want to revere him as God, which he is. But in human form, he experienced what we experienced. I mean, Christ ate material food. He slept. He got tired. If he had to use the restroom, he used his body to functions was just like ours. He took a crap and probably used leaves to wipe himself. I mean, people just get so super spiritual when it comes to the things of God in the book of God, in the word of God. Christ was the word made flesh, but he was flesh too. Supernatural means more natural. You don't have to become a spiritual, spiritual woo-woo. That's a lot of Christians. They have a spiritual woo-woo in there. Spiritual goonie birds, I call them. It's out there. God created reality. And Christ lived in and among real people. Experience what we experience. Now, the only difference with him, he was without sin. Because he was God.
And being in the fashion of man, he tamed the flesh. He didn't go his own way. And he paid the price so that we could have access to God and be reinstated once again, which Satan had stolen man's crown through our fallen father Adam and Eve that went after Satan and disobeyed God. He restored our inheritance that was stolen from the devil. We can have access now to eternity to heaven because of what Christ did at Calvary. It's what the cross represents, not what has been turned into freak shows, a circus, a religious relics, people putting crosses around their necks and thinking they're a Christian. No, the pagans were doing that. You could find that on the caves of Egypt. It's called the Ankh. Symbol of Tongues. It's what the cross symbolized. Christ said, take up a cross and follow me. He's not talking about a material cross. He's talking about a lifestyle. A dying to what you want, I will. Let's put, put Christ on the cross. I. Everybody teaching on them, plenty of teaching on that. The I factor, I call it. Uh, take a look at Lucifer. I did a lot of, on the video, I taught a lot of but anyway, God has a ministry for each and every one of us that are called. Now you got isolated ministries about God's under shepherds. That's the gift ministers. It's talked about in Ephesians. God gave some prophets, evangelists pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints to the work of the ministry. Those are under shepherds. And then you got the sheep within the ministry that's called to follow an under shepherd. There's no two ways in the kingdom. You're either out on point being an under shepherd building a ministry that God called you to or you're a sheep called to follow one of God's gift ministries. But we all have a ministry, even this sheep. Have a ministry within the ministry. Let me put it to you that way. That God has a job for you or a son. And to be on point is something totally different than ministering within the church. It's totally different. Okay, some of you, it's a problem with the church. You got a lot of commandeering and shift by those that get a little knowledge and they think God called them. You take the helm away from the pastor of the church. No, you're just a core. Get my teaching on core in the body. God called you, get my teaching, march and keep your mouth shut. I call it you just to follow orders from the gift ministry and work your ministry within that, not to overstep your back. It's a problem with so many egos in the church. Anybody want to be a superstar? Now, like I said, Christ was back to what I was saying about Christ. Christ had ordinary needs, just like us. And as the weight of the cross came down, he knew, fully aware of what his mission was. The price tag that was involved, he was fully aware of separation from God the Father, which has never happened. He's always been with God the Father. It's God the Son. And the experience, having all the world's sins poured out of him, all the world's diseases, he needed support. His human side was seeking support to be strengthened. We all need that. We all at some point in our life need someone to tell you, keep it up, you're doing a good job. No, don't quit. Words of encouragement. 
Keep the faith. Now, let's read Matthew 17, 4. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Oh, let me let me back up. Start at Matthew 17, 1. And after six days Jesus taken Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them unto a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Now these are two of God's famous general patent type prophets of the Old Testament. Two tough cookies that understood what it was like to be called, singled out, chosen, and have the weight of the responsibility of the whole world. Coming against you. The two prophets knew that. Moses knew it. Egypt was the greatest kingdom on earth at its time. It was ruling the whole world. Moses went up against Pharaoh. That's which represents the whole world. Went up against the whole world. And not only that. But of several times where you read, even it's leading his own people out of Egypt bondage, which represented a type of sin. It was God's chosen people. Moses was God's chosen man. They wanted to stone him on several occasions. There was insurrections within the camp. It's normal within the church, insurrections. You know, there's some, if you're real true man of God, they want to stone him. When you stand up for truth, that's just how it is. Come with the territory. Truth is a lonely fellow. Also, it has many friends. In a closed mind, it's like a closed fist. Nothing can get in, and nothing comes out of a closed fist. And these closed minded people can understand. These two great prophets that were among them. That was in their midst. And neither could the disciples. So God sent Elijah and Moses. The strength in Jesus because the disciples. He told them to watch and pray. They fell asleep. Now, before you get to critical of the disciples. You gotta understand, they, you know, they followed Jesus around. Jesus in the twilight of his ministry now, three, three and a half years. They followed Christ around. So you can imagine the demonic attacks that they were under. They didn't forsake it all to follow Christ. And they were with him 24-7 for three and a half years. So imagine the wear and tear spiritually. Well, you could get too critical. But Christ needed support. So God sent Elijah and Moses, two people, that, two great prophets, two great men of God, that understood what it was like to go out on point and be alone going up against the whole world of the system. It was the Elijah. The whole world was steeped in Baal and Peg. You know, Baal and Ashtar, which in his day, the whole world, including his own people. 
and he stood up for God's word at a time against Jezebel. Give him a teaching. I'm taught on Jezebel several times. Get Jezebel and get the other video Jezebel. Uh, or Jehu, Jezebel killed those two videos. But he knew what it's like to be alone. He went up against the pagan religion of his day, Ball and Astro, the whole world. It's going to come full circle. It's what's going on now. It's what Hollywood's pumping out, or Hollywood, excuse me. Hollywood's pumping out now. It's their proper name, Hollywood. It's going to come full circle. So God sent these two men that understood that, what it was like to go up against the whole world, take them. And here's Jesus, about to take the sins of the whole world, put that on his shoulder. The weight of the cross, the shame, the great weight. They are. And after six days, Jesus taking Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringing them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto him Moses and Elias talking with him. Moses and Elias. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. Let us build three temples. He's thinking flesh and earth. He's thinking like an ordinary man. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed him, and behold, a voice out of the cloud. Now, this is God the Father himself. It's called an epiphany in the Bible. God the Father himself had to speak out on this. Cloud overshadowed, behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. God the Father gave him confirmation. He sent Elijah and Moses to give him. To give him confirmation of his mission that lay ahead. And, he, and God the Father got him back. He said, My temple not built with anyone. We're the temple of God. God dwells in us. Human bodies. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched him and said, Arise, be not afraid. God wanted to shock and awe in him. To get out of this earthly mindset building uh, cathedrals and temples and churches. That's what the world does. God doesn't dwell in temples. Where, where was Jesus' church at? Where was the disciples? Where, where did they go preach? <laughs> it's ludicrous. That question I asked. Streets. They preached in the streets. Streets. It's a street priest ministry. They didn't have a temple. They didn't have a building. They preached on the seashores and the mountains, the wilderness, the streets of Jerusalem. When Jesus went up in the temple. It was the one time he was two, two times, I believe. Maybe three recorded when it's once he was a child, he was debating and teaching the, the uh, so called rabbis. One time he went up in there, he was to make a statement backing up that he was 
the Son of God, come to take away the sins of the world. Elijah, or excuse me, Isaiah's prophecy. And then one time he went up in there to clean house, did by teaching dead of thieves, overturning the money changers, tables, driving them with a rope with knots and fierce out, out the temple. Oh, good old loving Pastor Jesus. But other than that, Jesus taught on the streets, on the sidewalk, on the, on the roadsides, on the mountaintops, on the seashore, sitting in the boat one time, sat in the boat and talked. <laughs> See how far away Christianity's gotten from the original founder. Now, Elijah and Moses, back to the transfiguration. God ordered them to come back to help support Jesus and his mission to lie here. God always going to send something to point to this message. Even if he has to send someone like Elijah and Moses or an angel. Well, we have to read again. We go to now we're going to come up again with the end of Christ's ministry. Point of making God the Father supports his own. Now you read in Matthew 26, 36. So turn to Matthew 26, 36. Then come with Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and said unto them, and said unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. Okay, so he gave him a command. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Christ, what you could say, was depressed. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And watch with me. This is Christ, Son of God. God in the flesh, giving him an order to watch. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, but not as I will, but as thy will. He said, if it's possible, let me get up out of this cup, out of this, <laughs> going to the cross, the die business. If it's possible. But not as I will, but as you will. Is there any other way out? That's what he's asking. Besides the death of the cross. Now, what he feared was not the death itself. He feared being separated from God the Father at that point. That's the, what he feared. Oh, that's what he did not fear this good word, but that's what he did want to face. That's what he dreaded. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto them. Now, I'm sure hell had plenty of demons inside him that mountain to play violins and put them, them disciples to sleep. A lot of violins going on around that mountain. And he came unto his disciples and found that them asleep and said unto Peter, What do he could not watch with me one hour? Christ said you could even watch one hour. 
couldn't stay alert, or awake, vigilant, whatever. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. That's an order that applies to the disciples as well as us. It's in the Christian church. Watch. That's something you never hear. You got a lot of praying medicines out there. And that's all they do. They think that's pretty much it for Christianity. There's a lot more. But that's not the subject. But Jesus also ordered us to watch. Prayer is just part of it. We're to watch as well. To be alert. To be vigilant. We are to be watchers. Not just prayers. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Now we're born. You got a spirit. A soul in the Bible called body or flesh. Sorry. God, Paul used it interchangeably. The pneuma, the spirit. Paul used it interchangeably. The seat, the soul. It's used interchangeably. He said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, when you become a Christian, by faith through faith, God gives you his spirit. You can't see it. A lot of cases can't feel it. That's why you walk by faith. Some, some of us have experiences. And some of us have it. Because we walk by faith. But as you grow in God's word, and it's the spirit of God, grows. It needs to grow just like anything else that starts out as a babe in Christ or a babe in the world. It's a part of the problem now. you got too many babe tarts. They never grow. They're babe tart. The growth has been retarded. Not fully developed. That's what the word means. But anyway, they'll, they'll come to maturity. Paul Paul spoke of us becoming to maturity. The word perfect he used was mature. But here these are sleep. Like babies. Babies sleep a lot. A lot of, babies need a lot of sleep. <laughs> We're talking to the spiritual man, not the natural man. He's telling them in the spirit to be spiritually awake. Usually what affects the spirit world materializes and spill over, spills over into the material world. What affects the spiritual realm spills over into the material realm. So if you're asleep spiritually, it's no surprise when Christ tells you to stay awake and watch, you fall asleep physical. It makes sense though. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, the point of the Mount of Transfiguration and the title of this, <coughs> Ministering Spirits, <clears throat> we're, to be, we're, to, we're to watch. We're to be awake. We're ministering spirits. That's what we are. And we're to walk in the spirit, in the spirit realm. And you're to watch and be awake in the spirit realm, not to slumber. Jesus said, watch and pray. 
So many of you got your eyes closed, which allows Satan to walk up and wallop you across the head while you got your eyes closed. But you to watch and pray. Stay awake spiritually. Be alert spiritually. Don't be a ostrich with his head in the sand spiritually. It's a lot of Christians. Ostriches with their head in the sand. Oblivious. To what's going on around them in the world today. The Satan's children are running circles around them. Witches and warlocks and everything else on the march, on the run. Which they do believe in the spirit, spirit realm. And work and, and know how to work it against the church. So we need to wake up as the church and learn to understand true nature of spiritual warfare. Not this. A lot of Christians are good at rattling off scripture and verse and got the head to say and pray it's not what Christ was talking about the Bible says study to show yourself approved a lot of Christians we need, need a fresh baptism in returning to studying the word of God so many are following the roof is glitter teeth, smile and songs, New Age Bailey. And their books, they haven't put down the good book, the Bible, the book of books. They didn't put that down. Biblia, Biblia, book of books. They didn't put that down. For other books. Nothing wrong with it. reading other books. I'm an average person for reading. Reading is fundamental.